Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for joining this learning experience brought to you by Revenera. My name is Cody, and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning. We've got an exciting discussion ahead, but before we dive into things, I have just a couple of notes to review with everyone. First of all, we are recording our session today. So if you miss any of our conversation, if you'd like to watch again at a later time, or if you'd like to share this with the rest of your team, we will be sending you the recording via email as soon as we conclude this live session today. Now, if you'd like to get involved, there are a couple of ways to do so. Your first option is to use the chat tab on the right side of your screen. And when you find that chat tab, I'd like you to let us know from where in the world you're joining from today. If you have specific questions for our speakers, we do want you to send those into that Q&A tab on the right side of the chat section. We are going to do our best to answer some of these questions as we go, but we've also got some time set aside at the end to handle any questions that aren't touched on during our program. Um, so just send in those questions and we'll do our best to touch on them today. If you jump to that handout section, you'll see there are a whole bunch of resources there for you. So please take advantage of those and, and grab those before you leave. And finally, we will be selecting two of our most engaged attendees today to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So ways to become eligible are to send in chats, send in your questions, and fill out our post-webinar survey. More on that at the top of the hour. So without further ado, our topic today is the latest updates to cybersecurity regulations and what they mean for you. I'm joined by Alex Ryback, Senior Director of Product Management at Revenera. And we're also joined by Lynn Westfall, Software Supply Chain Expert and Consultant at The Modem Lisa. So Lynn and Alex, thank you both so much for joining us today on Tech Strong Learning. Alex, do you want to get things kicked off? Absolutely. So thank you, Cody. Lynn, good to be with you. Yeah, so, glad to be here. Yeah, so this is a, a very dynamic topic. So we're going to try to give you a snapshot. And in all reality, it will likely be outdated in a couple of weeks. So this is something where you definitely want to keep an eye out for a lot of these topics. We're going to try to summarize the past couple of years where there's been a lot of changes, a lot of work done by different industry groups just to kind of level set. And then I would definitely keep an eye on this because a lot of these are evolving and, and do change almost on a daily basis. So today's topics, uh, kind of what prompted all this and why. So we'll, we'll go back to the begin, the recent beginning on why the executive order came to be, why cybersecurity is such a hot topic in, in the industry today. Um, and then we'll focus on kind of three areas. So one is the cybersecurity regulations around the world. So we'll talk about both US and uh, EU. Um, cyber updates. We'll talk about the SEC, so kind of the financial side of it and what the SEC is doing. And then we'll jump into medical devices um, around the FDA. And those are um, kind of samples. There's lots of regulations everywhere. So we're going to try to hit kind of on a few larger ones, but definitely whatever industry your company's in or your customers are in, there is likely going to be a slice for that particular industry segment. Uh, then we'll talk about some quality metrics, some way to try to measure and just gauge kind of where you are and how trustworthy certain data is. Uh, spend a little bit of time around how to get started. There's going to be a lot of information. So if you aren't privy to it or if your company is just getting going, uh, where do you start? What do you do? And then uh, a little bit of what to pay attention to next. Okay, so with that being said, I will have Lynn kick us off. Yeah, so finally, we're seeing that cybersecurity is this global movement. And you have these organizations across the globe coming together to truly bring transparency to our software supply chain. Um, as we'll talk about a little later, there's an upcoming CISA, SBAMARAMA, and they've been connecting with agencies from Japan and the EU, as well as all the organizations throughout the United States to really push the needle forward on what is required and what really cybersecurity is defined as for the government agencies across the globe. And there's a lot of really exciting activity happening to collaborate between these groups. Momentum is really picking up. 
So it's um, something that, like Alex said already, you're going to have to keep your finger on the pulse because changes are going to start to come a lot more rapidly now from these agencies. Yeah, and even though a lot of these are kind of budding regulations, uh, no one's going to be right the first time. So even when something gets legislated, becomes codified as laws, there will be revisions going forward. There'll be refinements. So this is a, a long-term journey. So uh, we'll, we'll get right into it. So, okay, uh, this is very much uh, an eye chart, and it's designed to be as such. And this just gives you a sense of some of kind of the highlights of what's happened the last couple of years. So as part of my job at Revenera is to really kind of keep an eye on all this stuff and make sure that our teams are informed because we, we do build products in this area. And it is almost a full-time job just to try to keep up with everything that's happening. So what I wanted to do is really focus on the red bullets here, right? So start. Let, let's kind of start off back in you know 2011 when SPDX really kicked off. And that's one of the industry standards. So it stands for Software Package Data Exchange Format. It's one of the standards to uh, define licenses and to communicate contents of software across companies. Uh, fast forward about five, six years, Cyclone DX came up and that was a very similar concept, but a different approach. So SPDX is more of a bottom up approach on what is the license governing every single file in a software application. Cyclone DX is more of a top down. What are all the different packages that make up a software application? Uh, these were kind of early communities. You know, they had some involvement, but didn't really get into the front page until SolarWinds happened. And SolarWinds occurred in 2020. It was an IT uh, infrastructure company. And essentially what had happened was uh, their software was pretty much in everybody's data center, including the US government, military, private sector, public sector. So fairly ubiquitous software. Uh, nobody paid much attention to it. It was great, very useful, secure. You know, no, nobody worried about it till they had to. And what happened was in 2020, there was a breach and it was a supply chain attack, which actually made its way unnoticed through their build process um, many, many months before it was actually executed and exploited in the wild. And it had a huge impact across the world. Uh, there, they had over 18,000 organizations, as I mentioned, all over different sectors. There was foreign entities involved. This became a, a massive story back in 2020. And it was also towards the end of the year and where everybody was kind of focused on closing out their books, closing out their years, and suddenly this huge disruptive event occurred. Uh, since then, there were various lawsuits by the SEC. Uh, there were settlements, there was money exchange hands. So ultimately, what really came out of this was that the industry just wasn't ready to handle cybersecurity. No matter what the guidelines were, what the best practices were, people weren't doing it. And this kind of became a bellwether event for two reasons. Number one, it turned out to be a case where negligence was discussed, meaning it wasn't that people were trying to do their best and failed. It was that there was certain information that was allegedly not being uh, produced forthcomingly to investors of the company. So either things were hidden or things weren't fully disclosed. But at the end of the day, if you were an investor in this company, you were surprised. right? And that was a really big deal because it was a significant impact. So out of this, what had happened was we had uh, the U.S. executive order. That was a, a big push to get that written up. And the U.S. executive order around cybersecurity came out in May of 2021. And it was basically a, an overarching aspirational framework on how do we get better at doing this, right? And, and we meaning everybody. And the, the thing about it is it has lots of different pieces to it. There's focus around tooling and process and how to cooperate organization to organization. And one of the elements of it is how to deal with software transparency. Um, then you kind of fast forward a year into September 22, a similar thing propped up in the EU, which was the Cyber Resilience Act. Now they are slightly different and we'll, we'll kind of talk about each one independently, but ultimately they are trying to put a framework in place where engineers are doing the right thing, companies are doing the right thing, the proper security practices are in place. And when somebody buys your software, they can trust that you have done you know, re reasonable business effort to make it as secure as possible. And if something bad happens in the future, you notify your customers that they need to get an upgrade from you, right? So pretty kind of common sense stuff, but incredibly difficult to implement and to track and to manage and hold people accountable. Now, then you see there's a bunch of bullets below there. Uh, the 
uh, CISA got involved, uh, NIST got involved. So lots of government agencies were basically um, made responsible for taking this aspirational statement from the White House and from the EU and putting teeth behind it. So not just we would like to have better cybersecurity, but what do we actually do? What are the best practices? What are the frameworks? What do we do? How do we communicate? How often do we do it? So all of this work has been happening over the past couple of years. Uh, then in September 2023, the FDA revised its best practices around cybersecurity, which at that point had been over a decade old, and all of that was refreshed. And then December of last year, the SEC came in and put its rules into effect for anybody who is a publicly traded company. So we'll get into more details, and th this slide is shared in the handouts, so all these links are active. You can read up on whatever is relevant to your organization. But definitely, you know, this is a two-year snapshot, so you can imagine how much is happening day-to-day -day with all these different industry groups. Uh, anything you want to add to that? Well, I think if you were in the security industry, you know that it was almost like a line was drawn in the sand from that Solar Winds event, and it was the before time and the now time, where now we actually have to pay attention. And there was you know, kind of a wild, wild west software development mentality that, you know, really got a shock to the system and had to change at that point. So everything that followed from that point really made sense. And it, there, there was some lag. There's obviously um, resistance still to a lot of this, um, but we're starting to see a lot of those sort of arguments get played out and um, dismissed. So this this timeline is very helpful for anyone that's sort of just tiptoeing their way into this concept. But for those of us that have lived it, these were major impacts to our daily business. Yeah, and I'd say one more thing. You'll notice a lot of these bullets are coming from CISA, which is the, the government agency tasked with uh, improving the cybersecurity posture of the United States. And they have done a really nice job of writing lots of different position papers on what do you do if you're a developer? What do you do if you're a buyer? What do you do if you're in quality assurance? So definitely if you're new to the space or if you need better guidance on kind of how to get going, there's a document for you for sure, whatever context you're coming in with on their website. So, so check that out. Okay, so let, let's talk about kind of the, these two main kind of overarching regulations uh, that are uh, making their way through each individual kind of region around the world. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the US Cyber Executive Order came out in May 2021. Uh, we're basically getting, you know, we're almost at the three year anniversary here. Um, the goal of this was to bolster cybersecurity for both federal government and the private sector. Uh, today, we have had a ton of work done by lots of different people, lots of different groups, uh, lots of companies building tooling, uh, but there is still no official ban for federal agencies to buy software without what's called a software bill of material. So there's lots of carrots, there's lots of goodness and kind of lots of best practices, but there's still no stick, right? There's no enforcement, there's no uh, consequences or negative consequences for not following the best practices. So we are getting really close to where there is concrete requirements, where there are concrete uh, formats for how to communicate between companies, for how to essentially sign off that your customers can trust you. Uh, the thing that is still really being solidified is what is the format to do that? The format is certainly gonna be kind of beginning stages. It'll get refined and uh, become more robust over time. And then what happens if you don't follow it? You know, what, do you lose a deal? Is there a punishment? Is there a fine? So all of that is kind of yet to be worked out. Uh, as I mentioned, there's lots of best practice papers for various personas. So whether you're a supplier, buyer, if you're on a board of a company, if you're on a tooling team. So definitely look that up. It gives really good information on how to get going and what to, um, what to do to make sure that your process is robust enough to accommodate it. Um, the thing in the U.S. is we're, we got some speed bumps, right? We've got, we're in the middle of an election cycle. We may have new leadership coming into power. So are they going to amend the executive order? Are there going to be different rules put in place? So those are all kind of variables that are out there. And the really big thing is that uh, there are deadlines scheduled to occur in June of 2023, and industry just wasn't ready and not able to comply. So those got pushed out. So today we're kind of sitting on, you know, this is really complicated to do. It takes a lot of time and resources to align all these initiatives. 
And frankly, agencies just, a lot of them are facing budget and staffing shortages. So this is not something that is expected to quickly turn, but there's lots of work being done and definitely keep an eye out for actual legislation coming out of it. And um, as these yeah, groups keep um, developing more white papers with more information and better tooling is developed and improved, we get closer to that point where there's almost no excuse not to have the regulation in place. Because right now it's that pushback, it's that this is impactful to business in a way that we can't quite quantify, but that's that's not gonna last forever. And we're really just one major attack away from that foot being put down and saying, you know, this could have been prevented if we had these measures in place why isn't there a regulation? So that's why it's it's not something you can sleep on anymore. Absolutely. And there's so much tooling that's been developed that even if you've never done any of this before, there's lots of push button, both free and commercial tools out there to start building your software bill of materials. So there, the barrier to doing this is really low. Um, okay, on the flip side, so if we look at the EU, uh, the EU had a similar approach, right? It was called the Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, it essentially introduced mandatory cybersecurity requirements throughout the entire product life cycle, right? So starting from design to deployment, maintenance, and updating. Uh, it was politically agreed upon in November 23, right? So we have kind of a principal agreement in place. And then there is a two-year uh, adoption window that's been opened. So the expectation is that by 2026, at some point in 2026, uh, this will become law. There will be, you know, it'll be encoded into legislation and there will be defined consequences and best practices on how to comply. Uh, the one thing to note, and then you can kind of read up about this on the web, but there was a lot of friction initially when this came out because there was lots of burden put on open source developers. So if you are maintaining, uh, you know, a repository at GitHub and this is kind of your hobby, you're not doing this as part of your full-time employment, uh, there were obligations placed upon you as somebody who contributes to a project that somebody may use for commercial use. And what if there's a security problem, right? How much liability do you have in that case? So recent versions uh, of the Cyber Resilience Act have added some exemptions for that case. Uh, there's still debate on is that enough or if more is needed. So if you happen to be an individual who contributes to open source projects, Definitely something you want to read up on just to make sure that you're at least aware of what obligations may be placed um, upon you. Um, the, the last kind of takeaway I'll say here is it is very likely, although the Cyber Resilience Act came second, that it will outpace the U.S. Cyber Executive Order on when it'll actually become law. So definitely, you know, depending on what areas you work in or where your, your customers are, where you sell into, uh, make sure you're aware of both and kind of where they are in their life cycle. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the software self-attestation form. So this is kind of an agreement on a company is going to do whatever they're going to do, right? There's lots of best practices on how they should do it. There is no one way to do it. There's lots of different ways. So kind of your chief security officer, your legal, your security teams will agree on what works for your company. At the end of the day, you have to somehow inform your customers or your partners, if you're in the middle of a software supply chain, that you have done what you were supposed to do and that you can be trusted. And the way we do that is a high ranking executive at your company is going to sign a form. And the form will essentially say that to our best knowledge, we have followed best practices. So what this means is you're really talking about kind of four things. So by signing it, you're saying that you are working in a secure environment. And again, these are all kind of very abstract terms. So how you define that will vary. Uh, that you have made a good faith effort to maintain control over your supply chain and over your code, right? So you kind of, you control what's happening. That you maintain provenance, uh, meaning you're aware of all of your dependencies, where they come from, and they're documented. And that you have a process to automatically check for security vulnerabilities. So all of these things are kind of very high level, very kind of overarching, but they really make up best practices for any sort of security program. So it's not a huge lift to get these in place. What is a huge lift is to make sure that everybody at your company is trained, 
that they're accountable, that they're set up to succeed, and that you have all of this documented so that if anybody ever asks, you could prove that you're doing these things. Now, the thing that's important to note, if you look in the first bullet is this will date back to September 14th of 22. So if you are selling anything to the US government as of whenever this becomes law, uh, and your software was either uh, developed on the 22nd, or uh, if it was patched with a major, you know, modified with a major patch on that date or later, then it becomes subject to these rules. And you can see below, there's a couple of consequences for non-compliance. Again, these are things that are still getting worked out, so I wouldn't take this too literally, but definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, this is in concept kind of similar to the SolarWinds lawsuit in that if somebody signs this, they could potentially be held personally liable if there's any sort of negligence discovered. So definitely a high bar for companies and definitely something that will get pushed down to engineering teams because you know your CEO, your CISO, your CEO will be signing something and they're want to, going to want to be sure that they're okay to sign that piece of paper. Yeah, like Alex said, you really want to have that documentation in place. The right policies are what's going to get you through any major lawsuit. Obviously, we're not lawyers. We can't give you legal advice on this call, but that's what it's going to come down to is, you know, can you really prove that good faith effort and that you were prepared and having those policies in place is a critical part of that. Yeah, and, and this by no means is comprehensive. There's lots of other documents, you know, there's DORA form, there's NIST 2 in the EU. So there, there's other things to pay attention to. So definitely, you know, work with your security legal teams. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to kind of give you a, a flyby on the, the overarching regulations, but there's lots of different ones depending on what industry you may be in. And, and thank you to people posting in the chat. Uh, if there's more specifics you want to share, then, then please continue to do so. Um, okay. So let's talk about this topic. This is really important because any sort of cybersecurity regulation you're going to read about or any sort of best practices is going to come back to kind of the most basic point, which is don't bolt on security later on, right? Um, easy to say. Clearly, if you're starting a brand new ground up kind of greenfield application, you can certainly start with, um, you know, making sure you do threat analysis, threat modeling, you've got all the tools in place and all that. But what do you do if your software has been out there for a decade, right? Um, the, the topics that are really important to understand is security by design, security by default. So what this really means is when your product goes out the door, you need to do whatever you can to make sure that it is the most secure possible by default. Right. Don't expect that your customers are going to turn on SSL or they're going to you know, change the default password or they're going to close certain ports. The concept is that as a software supplier, you need to make sure that you're integrating product security into the culture of the team building the product. And it can't be something that's done at the very end. It can't be something that's done after release in the next version. It needs to be upfront and as part of the architecture of the product. Uh, it needs to go as far as maybe revamping designs and programs and checkpoints, uh, expanding kind of your, your quality checklist to make sure that this is a forethought, not an afterthought. And if you are a software buyer, you need to start holding your software suppliers accountable to make sure that they are doing this. Because at the end of the day, you're the one who's deploying it, you're the one who's using the product, and your data is what's going to be at risk. And there's a lot of stuff on the slide. Uh, you know, you can read that by downloading the slide itself, I'm not going to go through it. But a couple of things I do want to call out is if you look at kind of security by design tactics, there's lots of tools that should be part of standard automated process. So static security testing, dynamic use security testing, software composition analysis scans, building your bill of material, because if you don't know what's inside your software, how do you take steps to secure it? So these are things that are important. If you are on an engineering team and you're not aware whether these things are being done, Make sure you talk to your security teams, talk to engineering management, and make sure that these are all automated processes as part of your uh, build pipelines. I mean, this is all about stopping the stacking of technical debt. You know, if you've been developing for years without you know, security at the forefront of your process, you probably have some catch up to do. I think that on the software buyer side, there's a lot of knowledge gain that needs to be made so that you're asking the right questions when you're buying and you're making sure that what you're buying is secure by, de by 
default by design and not something that is an afterthought for that company as well. Yep. And, and the other thing to note is uh, the standard assumption should be that your developers probably didn't go through this in college. Uh, these are topics that today there's much more security topics being taught, but certainly open source licensing, open source security, security best practices, these are not things that were taught 10 years ago in school. So make sure that you figure out if there's a skill gap, if there's an education gap and fill that with your own internal training or maybe go outside for kind of industry best practice training. But there's lots of free training available, lots of paid training available. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out what works for your team and your company. Okay, so let's talk about the SEC. So the SEC is essentially in charge of making sure that uh, public companies are doing everything possible to secure their investors, right? If you put money into a company and there are things happening where, that put the value of the company at risk or its ability to generate revenue or its ability to retain customers, you as an investor in that company have a right to know that. So there's really two vehicles that uh, are in place to do that. So one is a 10K form. This is kind of your annual report and every public company files one. And in the report, it basically talks about any sort of material risk to the health of the company, right? If you just signed up a new customer that's responsible for half your revenue, that's a big risk, right? If the customer goes away, suddenly you got a major revenue drop. Uh, if you lost a customer, if you have a new CEO, you have a new executive, these are things that are always part of the form. Um, as of December 18th of last year, cybersecurity is now another bullet that needs to be considered a risk. So if you have anything where your cybersecurity posture is putting the value of your company or your ability to conduct business at risk, it needs to be disclosed on the 10K form. Now, the 10K is an annual form. There's also an 8K, which is if anything unexpected happens, good or bad, right? You have four business days to notify the market of that event. So think of it as a mini 10K based on some sort of trigger. And uh, a material cyber event is a new trigger, right? So if your company was hacked, if you found a new vulnerability, if a customer reported a major exploitability in your product and you are a publicly traded company, you're obligated within four business days to make that public information. Now, in most companies, engineering security teams typically don't have a an ongoing dialogue with finance, right? So this is difficult for companies to do. You take, you know, company on the scale of Microsoft or IBM or any large company, there's hundreds, if not thousands of product teams. There's lots of different finance teams. Just connecting people to talk to each other is a big deal. So if you are a publicly traded company and you are on kind of the tech side of the house, make sure that you are aware of this. Make sure that you talk to finance and figure out what your company is doing to comply with this. Uh, much like the previous topic, this also is an area where if someone is deemed to be negligent, there could potentially be personal liability. So again, we're not lawyers, we're not dispensing legal advice, but just you know, when you are talking to your management, make sure that you talk about this, uh, this topic, make sure it's part of your policies, part of your practices, and that your teams are connected and communicating about this. And if you're not a publicly traded company and thinking this isn't something that I should be worried about, I don't need to be aware of, remember that your customers might be publicly traded and that you want to mitigate the risks to them as well. And that they'll be thinking about this more as they're buying your products. Absolutely. Okay, a couple examples. Um, Clorox back in August of last year had a ransomware attack, right? Publicly traded company, um, significant impact to their bottom line. Uh, this basically was uh, an attack to their supply chain. It was an attack to one of their manufacturing facilities. It impacted their ability to deliver product. It took them months to kind of unravel all that. And they ended up filing an 8K. So they followed the rules, they did all the right stuff. In fact, before this became mandatory. So they filed an AK in October 4th. It's publicly available. So take a look at it. But there is a serious impact, right? It, it, they spent almost $25 million just to deal with it. Their stock had a major drop. So the point is that these are not things to ignore, right? These have significant impact to the bottom line. Uh, it is critically important that you get ahead of this stuff, right? You don't want to ever have to take anything off the market, pull a team out of planned work, and basically be on your heels, right? The more you can get ahead of this, the less disruption there will be to your engineering teams, to your product teams, if you're not in the software world. 
uh, these are all really important things to make sure that are worked into your process. And there's links provided in the slides if you want to read up on more details about this. Um, second case was MGM, similar thing, right? Back in September, lots of different MGM properties. I believe there are eight different properties in Vegas alone and others outside of Vegas that were impacted by a ransomware attack where slot machines went haywire, their uh, hoteling system to check in customers was down. So effectively, they were unable to real, you know, recognize all of their revenue because there were systems that prevented them from doing business. And this went on for many, many weeks. You can imagine a casino being impacted on generating revenue and how much money that's actually costing. So again, another example of a company that did the right thing, filed all the right papers at the right time, uh, but a huge impact, right? So you, you definitely do not want to be on your heels when it comes to, to these types of events. Okay, so we talked about financial sector. Now let's talk about medical, right? So effectively, the way I would look at this is anything that has any sort of, uh, you know, impact to human well-being, whether it drives or flies or shoots or has to do with medicine, anything that could have a negative impact on anybody, right, uh, needs a higher standard of care as far as intention given to cybersecurity. Right. If you're dealing with uh, a little piece of software that is a game, the, you know, the, the level of attention on that versus something that powers a water plant or a nuclear power plant or a smart car or like anything, you know, that has human kind of well-being at risk uh, will definitely require lots more eyeballs. Uh, FDA for sure takes this seriously. They have revamped uh, their cybersecurity regulations from 2014, which is the last time they went through the cycle. Uh, this all went live last year, and essentially it is focused on any sort of medical devices with cybersecurity risk. So anything that has software, which today is most medical devices, and anything that has an ability to be networked. So if you have an MRI machine that takes the results and sends it to a, a radiologist to interpret, that's connected. It's sending electronic data. Uh, it's covered by HIPAA for privacy rights, and it has the potential for being exploited, right? So this is something that uh, these rules are really for any sort of new submissions or anything undergoing significant changes. So similar to what we talked about before with the software dating back to 2022, with respect to medical devices, it's really anything new or anything that is significant update from uh, historical release. Um, there's lots of details in this regulation, but essentially they're talking about similar things, threat modeling, risk assessment, security controls, uh, making sure you know what is inside the software, so all your third-party dependencies. And once something goes live, make sure you have a program to monitor and patch, right? Which is probably the most important part because no matter how secure something is today, there could be a new security issue tomorrow. And if you have no process to monitor and react to that, it, everything you've done up to the point of releasing your product is essentially moot at that point. So this cybersecurity regulation is written in two contexts. There's a context kind of pre-release and then context around reporting and uh, um, alerting, monitoring, and patching. Okay, okay. Um, so let's talk about kind of trust metrics, right? So, so how do you assess any of this? Like, how do you know something is good or bad or when it was good, when it was bad, when do you need to do something about it? So there's lots of different programs in place. We wanted to really focus on three of them and come up with kind of some analogies so you just understand how this works. Uh, so the first one is fairly new. Uh, it's called a Cyber Trust Mark. It's coming from the FCC, um, and it's essentially a labeling program for smart embedded and uh, IoT devices. And the idea is, you know, whenever you buy your appliances, they've got an Energy Star label on it, and they tell you that this thing is uh, designed to consume least amount of energy possible. Here's how much it's gonna save you. And kind of here's a grade. So if you're comparing two different refrigerators, you may choose to buy one versus the other based on kind of how resource intensive it may be. Uh, similar thing here, right? It's essentially a quality seal. Uh, it's in its really early stages, right? It's kind of conceptual at this point. It's uh, getting a lot of momentum uh, in the EU. There's lots of international support behind it. Uh, the challenges are really around defining scope, uh, defining a clear labeling scheme, and then aging, uh, educating customers on what it means and how to interpret it. Like, what does it mean when it has a seal? And 
how, what is the life cycle of a seal, right? It may be good today, tomorrow there's an issue. Do you lose the seal? Do you update the seal? Are there kind of footnotes to the seal itself? So how do you go about interpreting what it means to kind of get the sticker? Um, in the middle, there's a similar concept, but a little different context, which is similar, similar to if you go to a restaurant, right? Right outside the window, there's typically um, a report card for its health grade, right? Uh, the issue with these things is they're kind of snapshots, right? So your restaurant could have been reviewed last March and it was great. And now you have a infestation in October. And until next March, unless there's a triggering event, you may still have a letter A grade, right? So a lot of these things are really important to have dynamic where you get a score, but you know as of which date that score applies. So Canada's partnering with an organization called Security Scorecard. Your companies may you know, work with that company. I know we do. Uh, they essentially give you like a letter grade for how good you are in security in your organization. And the way that this company works is it's really easy to drop your score and it's really hard to elevate your score, which makes sense. That's how it should be. So there's a pretty high burden to go from, you know, a B to an A. But if there are certain things identified automatically, it's very easy to drop from an A to a B. So it's kind of centered around being more conservative and really taking the, the consumer's point of view on how much risk you're actually facing. Um, so the, you know, the White House has raised the possibility of grading U.S. companies potentially. Um, but it's essentially the same concept as what we do with restaurants and hotels and, you know, anything that can impact human health. And, and again, the key takeaway here is it can't be a static grade, right? It has to be, it's an A as of this date. And the longer, you know, the, the older that date is, the more suspicious you should be of that grade. Um, and then the third context is around AI. So AI, you know, clearly that's a whole separate webinar we can do. But there, you know, when you're talking about anything that's kind of AI generated, there's always a trust concern. Um, I would say if we're talking about anything you want AI, your default should be I trust nothing unless somebody proves to me that it's trustworthy, as opposed to the other way around. So there's a concept of watermarking in AI, which is basically some sort of label that says this appears to be generated versus created by a human. Uh, the challenge with that, I mean, the, the spirit is good, right? The intent is good. We're going to give you a heads up that, hey, you may want to be a little more uh, suspicious of this. The, the challenge is just the scope and the scale and the accuracy, right? Uh, how do you prove that you've assessed every single element and every single file and every single video, every single document? and that you flagged everyone that could be AI generated. So to me, this is all about context. Right? You start with distrust of everything, kind of zero trust principle. And then when there's a trustworthy mark that says, yes, this has passed through some sort of uh, inspection and it is clearly flagged as you know either generated or not, then perhaps you change your point of view. Uh, the real concerns about this is if you just rely on the watermark, then false positives and false negatives are a real problem, especially uh, the false negatives, right? What, what if it wasn't um, you know, properly assessed or what if somebody failed to put a watermark on it? Well, you can't just assume it was not generated, right? So, so that's the real concern. And uh, you know, how can you ever be certain? How can this comprehensively be done? There's like billions of elements out there that are AI generated. How can anybody ever catch up to the collateral that's already put, been put out there? So three kind of three different contexts, three very similar concepts. Um, definitely something to pay attention to. They're all emerging, all kind of brand new ideas. Um, and lots of changes are expected before these things really kind of get to mass market. Now's a great time to be thinking about how you would track this kind of data, how you would collect this along the way, how you would continue to monitor what you're intaking and it's different labels and grades and watermarks you know how you're going to understand that you've gone through that checkpoint of knowing it's met these qualities and it continues to meet those ongoing yep and and there's a, a comment in the chat here just you know uh, working as a data protection officer in europe security is just another thing yeah absolutely right it's just another slice of risk so I would say if you are working in any sort of area in your company where you are dealing with cybersecurity risk, either as a buyer or as a producer of software or hardware, um, go kind of start top down. You know, CFO typically is the person who owns risk. And under the CFO, you kind of start splitting out into IT and legal and finance and business and engineering. All of those things ultimately roll up to corporate risk. So uh, absolutely, it's another slice. Uh, 
if you don't have a process, chances are you have processes for other things that will apply to this just fine. Uh, you just need to be aware and make sure that you know people are talking to each other and that if you do have processes that your teams are educated to know what they are and that they're being followed. And I'm guessing if you know security is just another thing, it's not really just another thing like customer relations or finance or accounting where those things are pretty static. You don't have a lot of continual evolution happening in those markets. But when you when it comes to security, the tide is changing at all the time. So it's not, you know, as easy to say, oh, you know, it's just something we always consider in our processes because it's something that's going to change much more rapidly than your other processes. Absolutely. And you're always going to be behind the, the bad actors, right? The bad actors will always be ahead. Um, you know, no different than, you know, performance enhancing things in sports, right? They're the, the people that are trying to do bad will always be ahead of the people trying to catch them. So you just have to make sure that you're continuously educating, refining your skill sets and putting best practices into play, right? Um, and, and you have to, you want to do this as proactively as possible because otherwise you're never going to release anything, right? You can't, if you're going to do security at the very end, you're really going to destroy your roadmaps and your customer commitments. And you really want to bake this in and make it part of your culture for all of your product teams. Okay. Um, so let's talk about kind of SBOM maturity. So SBOM stand for software bill material. Think of it as your ingredients label that you have on all food items, but for software, right? And there's really two elements to software bill materials that are important. One is the ingredients list, which is you know what components are in my software. And a component could be operating system database, it could be commercial, it could be open source, it could be a line of code, right? From an author, you know, individual developer, or it could be a massive library, you know, Linux operating system with 60,000 files. So they come in all kind of shapes and sizes, different licenses and so forth. So number one, it's important to understand what is your list of inventory, what's the bill material. The second part that's important is what security risk does each of these parts carry at a given point in time? So the, your bill of material will be static release to release because the, your product isn't changing, but the security posture will change all the time. So the, as a best practice, typically you have a listing of all of your parts in your SBOM, and then you have a companion document, uh, which is either a vulnerability disclosure report, a security report. Uh, there's a concept of kind of a negating VEX report, which says what you really need to focus on from every single vulnerability, but you need some sort of, as of this second, what does security look like for my product given all of my parts? So really important that if you are producing these or if you're buying software and you're asking for these from your vendors, you need both, right? An SBOM without the security report uh, tells you what you have, but it tell, doesn't tell you what to be concerned about. And likewise, a static security report from three months ago is likely invalid at this point. So you definitely want these to either be real time or updated on a continual basis. Uh, so on our website, you can see the link here on the bottom left there, but we ran a survey where we asked people lots of different questions around their, to kind of ascertain their level of uh, SBOM maturity. Uh, this is the, the only stat we really want to talk about, but this is really interesting where 75% of respondents really didn't do anything with the SBOMs that they received. All right, so we've always talked about in you know, past webinars and kind of best practices, everybody should be building these SBOMs. But the real question is, well, what are people doing with them when you give them to somebody? And as of late 2023, the answer was nothing, right? Either we don't know to ask, or we've asked and they said no, or we've asked and they said not yet, but we'll have it available at some point. Uh, or they did provide it and people just kind of stashed them away on a drive somewhere. All right, so only 18% out of the ones we surveyed actually did something with them to where they made business decisions based on looking at the data, whether it was done through a spreadsheet or ingested into an SBOM management system. Uh, a really small percentage of people um, made kind of business sense and business use out of this data. This will for sure change in 24, uh, no doubt. Because number one, some people will be forced to do this, depending on whether you're selling to the government or the public sector. And um, you know, we'll come to this point a little bit later, but even if you're not impacted because you're not selling to the government, this will hit the private sector as well, right? It's not gonna be far behind. So typically the private sector kind of models what the public sector does as far as best practices. So even if you only sell to consumers, if you don't sell to any regulated industries, this will become a best practice for anybody dealing with software or intelligent hardware. So 
uh, definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, we expect this to flip in the next year or two where there will just be an expectation that this data is not just emailed over to you, that there is an electronic transmission, that it's secure, it's at scale, it's done continuously to a point where we do envision at some point there will be something plugged into everybody's build, which will update a registry of build materials somewhere to where customers can come in self-service and just get an up-to-date snapshot of what their true risks may be. There's a question in the chat that plays right into this. Um, so the question is, technologies and impacting factors change fast and relevant laws, regulations are formed and enforced quite late. How can we overcome this critical issue? Well, you're you're starting with that here. You're you're getting knowledgeable about what's going on and you know, get out there and get that information and get to a point where you understand it and you can communicate it throughout your organization and stay ahead of, of when that's going to be enforced. Um, so, you know, the, those companies here, that 18% that's already ingesting into an SBOM management system, they're setting themselves up for success. Okay. Um, so let's talk about kind of key, key takeaways, you know, uh, Lynn kind of talked about one of them, right? So get involved with industry groups. There's lots of industry groups. They don't meet that often, right? Once a week, some of them are once a month. Um, lots of great kind of sharing of experiences, best practices. There's groups for every perspective. There's groups for people building tools. There's groups of people consuming data, groups for people kind of watching on the periphery and just observers. Um, you know, find a home and engage, right? And especially if you are a big company or if you have lots of software vendors, there's lots of influence you have by being part of these groups. Uh, there is not one brilliant person in the world that's writing all this stuff down. This is all groupthink, community engagement, community defined. So engage and, and get involved. Um, the other thing is, you know, get, form a partnership with your suppliers. Don't, don't just pay them, right? Uh, make sure that your contracts for buying software consider this stuff. Like what happens if there's a breach? How long do they have to notify you about it? Uh, when can you expect an update? How often do they send you an updated security report? Uh, these are all things that typically procurement wasn't really involved with, but they need to become involved with that going forward. And also, you know, get, get involved with companies like us, you know, get involved with people that are building tools in the space, provide your requirements. Um, you're going to have to do this at scale in the near term, right? Which means if you have a thousand vendors, you're going to get a thousand S bombs that may be updated on a monthly basis, a weekly basis, daily. You you got to put a process in place to be able to make this data actionable and not just stash it away and get overwhelmed in your email. So talk to the vendors, make sure that you know their roadmaps and their future plans align with your needs, even if you're not their customer. Uh, there's ways to reach out. There's communities. You know you can always reach out to me for any of our tools. Um, definitely something that companies want to hear because. You know, we're, we're building tools to address the needs of the software buyers and producers. So really good to get this feedback. Yeah, you, you want to get those processes in place now um, because you don't want to be that single point of failure in your company. You know, you're the, you're the buyer and you get all this information from your vendors and you're overwhelmed by it and you don't communicate it to the right teams within your organization. It's still a problem. So just asking for it is going to be a starting point, but getting to that point where there's a nice flow of that information through your organization is where you want to be. All right. So um, how do you start? Right. I'm sure there's lots of people here that are working at companies that are really good at all this, and there's others that have not done anything. Right. So um, we saw in our assessment that this was definitely not a normal distribution. It was very weighted towards immature. Uh, in fact, we didn't have a single company that was mature to the standards where this is at scale, it's secure, all of their vendors provide data, they provide data to everybody, people can self-service, right? So the industry itself is somewhere in between immature and in the middle. And most people are still on the immature side of this because, well, we don't even have laws yet, right? So clearly we're kind of at the infancy of this. So we always talk about kind of a three-step process. And I'll talk about it from a software producer perspective. And Lynn, having been one of my former customers, can talk about it from the software buyer perspective. So make sure your company is operating within a security framework. Doesn't matter which one, right? There's best practices, there's recommendations for which one. But don't do this ad hoc and don't just kind of, you know, 
try to plug the hole with gum, right? Like have a process and have, think about what works best for your company at your scale, your size, what are your customers doing? What are your suppliers doing, right? Maybe borrow from what your supply chain is doing and don't try to reinvent too much. Um, make sure that you are not only looking at security scans, but you're also doing composition scans. So you need to do static analysis for the code your team writes. You need to do SCA, which is software composition analysis for all of your third-party dependencies. And you need to do dynamic and pen testing and real-time testing on how does your application actually function when it's deployed. All three contexts are critically important. They target different areas of security risk and all of them are required. They don't necessarily all require equal investment. That's for you to decide, but it's not enough to do two of the three and ignore the third because security is a system thing, right? If there's an area that's untouched, that means the entire system becomes insecure. Uh, the second part to this is policy, which is critically important, right? If you do nothing else, go talk to your legal security team and come up with rules. All right, what is our corporate policy? What do we do about open source? What do we do about risk? How often do we update these things? How often do we do scans? Um, as a default, people need to understand that you can't just grab things from anywhere without paying attention to entitlements, to licenses, to security. Anything you put into your product ultimately is on you and your brand is at stake if something goes wrong, not the person who supplied it to you. So you have to take this serious and at a minimum, at least educate everybody on how do you do this at the level of sophistication where your company exists today. Um, and then get into the SBOM game, right? Start building them. There's hundreds of tools out there. You can pay for a tool, you can get free tools. It's very easy to build an SBOM. It's very hard to build a good one, but it's very easy to build one and to have one to start with. And then talk about it, right? Show it to your customers. What do you think? Is this enough? Do you need more? How? Let's come to an agreement how often we do this, right? Uh, agree on format. There was a question I think floated by around uh, different formats. Um, actually, let's maybe address that real quick. So there's a question around since all these standards are changing, you know, do we foresee format changes? Yeah, absolutely. There will be a new version of SPDX 3.0 coming out. There is constant updates to Cyclone DX. Uh, do we see the two converging? Probably not. They're from a different kind of point of view, uh, but that's fine, right? They're interchangeable. There's ways to convert them. Uh, if you have a good vendor around SBOM management, they will be able to ingest both and transform from one to the other. So it doesn't really matter. It, whatever is best for your company uh, based on your needs or based on your customer needs, pick a format. It, it doesn't matter. Start with one. Uh, but yes, for sure, they will evolve. They're all very bare bones today. There will be a lot more required data over time. Uh, but yes, uh, pick you know pick, pick a camp. And it doesn't mean you only have to use one across your company. You can use both, whatever is a better fit. Um, and then uh, work with procurement, right? It's uh, Procurement is really good at buying commercial software, but if anything non-commercial comes in, it doesn't go through the same process. So there's not a lot of eyeballs on it. There's not a lot of scrutiny on it often. It's a bottom-up selection versus top-down, meaning a de an individual developer is making an in individual decision, which may impact the whole company versus somebody in procurement vetting a vendor and paying money for their software with the identification and contracts and so forth. So make sure that they're involved and make sure that they're imposing requirements in the contracts that protect you as a software buyer. Yeah, certainly if you're on the buy side or the ITAM side, which I was as well, you know that it's important to understand the security framework of the products that you're bringing in, what they adhere to, what they've done to make that secure and that you have a policy for taking in that. You know, Alex mentioned, you know, often your open source policy is different from your commercial policy. Maybe you only have IT procurement, you don't have IT asset management, or that's kind of a scattered role. So really figuring out who owns these different parts of the process, who is evaluating the licensing of each product, whether it's different between open source and commercial, and, you know, Alex also spoke to, and this question spoke to the formats, you know, a lot of the, the minimum requirements and things built into the SBOM formats today are not sufficient. And the industry understands this. If you're able to jump into the CISA groups or any of the other industry groups going on, you'll hear that there's a lot of work being done to expand what fields are available in these formats? What do they mean? How do we expand the minimum requirements? Um, today, one, licensing isn't even a minimum requirement to have in your SBOM. And for many of us on the buy side, 
that's really all we care about. I mean, yes, we care about the security. We're here to talk about security, but there's still a lot to be desired from uh, a management on the procurement side. But you still want to follow this. You want to make sure that your company has the right policies in place and you have a process for the consumption, the ingestion of that data, and then the dissemination throughout the di different organizations within your company to make sure that security, legal, and management are all on board with bringing on that new piece of software, whatever it could be. So, you don't need a crystal ball, right, to know that what's coming next are more hard regulations and definitely more visibility throughout the industry as the public sector, the FDA rules, all of that stuff starts to become more prevalent. And certainly, like we saw with Clorox and MGM, as we have more high visibility attacks, we're going to see more requirements for meeting these uh, regulations and more requirements for doing these things proactively, even if there aren't regulations in place, because companies just want to avoid having that very public issue exposed. There's also a lot of, like we just said, there's a lot of shakeout to what it means to be an SBOM, what it means to be an attestation, what those documents should be formatted, what they should look like, and how you process them. So you're going to see changes to that. And there's even a lot of movement towards tools that are agnostic to format um, and different qualities of those formats coming out as more important. So you will see a lot of change coming there. And you just, you don't want to be that organization that has that very visible public attack that you have to make, uh, you know, everyone aware of because you're publicly traded. You have to put out that 8K. So, you know, don't be that organization. Be ready and uh, avoid it and be the hero to your organization instead. So definitely get involved. Like we've been talking a lot throughout this whole conversation about CISA, the other organizations. Every day of the week, there's something that you can hop in on, but there's also, you know, there's so much going on that you can really hone in on just what's important to you. And a way to figure that out would be to join me and CISA on Thursday at SBAMARAMA. I think this is the third one that they're having, and this is an entirely virtual event. Um, but you'll have a lot of different speakers from CISA and the subgroups. So you'll learn what, what all the activity in the subgroups are having. There's also going to be um, speakers from around the globe and many different organizations. So I really encourage you to join um, and not only to, to join for SBOMARAMA, but to join the different groups within CISA, OpenSSF, OWASP, SPDX. You know, you, you, you take your choice where you want to be involved because there's just lots of opportunity there. Okay, um, got a couple minutes left. I see there's a, a few questions, so let's maybe grab some of those. Sure. So we're going to fit as many as we can <laughs> and we have left. Um, so we have one right here says, is there a recurring cadence to review the existing security regulations or the need for new security regulations? So how often should we be checking back into this? Mm -hmm. start, Lynn? That's a tough question. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think, you know, you could maybe create some news alerts out there so that things are coming into you when they're hot. If you're sort of dropping into these CISA or other group calls, maybe, you know, once a month, it's, it's hard to say what the cadence should be because the change is pretty quick. But I would say if you're not at least checking on something once a month, or you're not, you know, at least making sure you're up to, on the new news, um, you're going to fall behind quickly. Yeah, I'd say if nothing else, uh, go to CISA, subscribe to their updates. They're typically pretty good at aggregating all different content into a best practices guide. 
So at least stay on top of those. They usually release them, you know, once a month, once a quarter. Um, as far as updates, uh, yes, for sure. But we, we haven't gotten to like the beginning yet. So once there's something written down as actual rules, yes, there will. I'm sure there will be frequent updates until we get it right. All right, and it looks like we've got time for one more question. So what are your thoughts about incorporating this into the DevSecOps environment? Yes, 100%. Um, you have to do it. This can't scale to humans, right? There's definitely parts of this where a human is required. You have to assess, you know, there's 100 vulnerabilities, that 100 of them won't impact you. So you have to use your brain in some cases and kind of determine what's most important to you. But if you are a software producer and you're expecting someone to remember to do this at the end, you're going to forget. So this has to be built tight into your build. You have to do automated scans. You have to clear out vulnerabilities. You have to do it again when you're ready to ship because things have changed since you last ran this. There's lots of different kind of rings to this thing. Uh, but yes, for sure, this has to start with automated as part of your pipelines. And, and all the vendors do it, right? They're, all these tools are designed to be incorporated and run automatically. Yeah, there's there's a CISA document on the different types of SBOM, the different phases that you would generate an SBOM. And it's all about being incorporated into every aspect of your DevOps process. So you've got to make sure that you have not only tooling, I would say overlapping tooling in place to make sure that you're not just relying on one tool. Um, you know, there's no silver bullet out there yet. So I would say, you know, make sure that you are just collecting and evaluating as much as you possibly can along the process. All right. Well, Lynn and Alex, thank you both so much for spending the past hour with me here on Tech Strong Learning. It's been, been such a pleasure to hear from you today. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you to everybody for attending. All right. So before I release everyone, a couple final reminders. I'll start off by pointing out the handout section. There are a ton of resources, so do grab those while I continue to close things out. Um, I would like to remind everyone that our session was recorded today. We will be sending you the recording via email, but you'll also find it living on the Security Boulevard website. That's securityboulevard.com slash webinars. Um, thank you to everyone for your chats and questions throughout our program today. Um, you really, really gave us a lot to work with, and all of you are eligible for our $50 Amazon gift card giveaway. Um, if you'd still like to become eligible, there is the post-webinar survey pinned to the top of the chat, as well as in the handouts. We would love to hear your thoughts about today's program. I'd like to thank Revenera for sponsoring our program. And once again, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you spending time with us today, and we hope to see you at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day, and you may now disconnect. Thanks again, Lynn and Alex.